Good afternoon. My name is Lionel T. Dean. I describe myself as a product artist, somewhere between um, an artist and a conventional industrial designer. A little bit of engineering thrown in there as well, which I don't really speak about. Um, and I've been working with, um, exclusively with Additive for over a decade now. I run a project called Future Factories, which began in 2003. And that was looking at the research question, why, don't we use, uh, why can't we use additive manufacture for high-end decorative um, consumer artifacts? It was a very quick question to answer. It's too slow and too expensive. And that remains the case today, pretty much. It's too slow and too expensive if we do like for like. So the trick is not to do like for like and to find some justification for using this, this high-end technology. And in the high-end engineering applications such as aerospace, medical, motorsport, that's quite easy to do because there are things that you can make that are far too difficult to, geometries that are far too difficult to achieve with, with conventional uh, manufacturing technologies. It's less true in, 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 um, in decorative goods because there's always a way of making it. You can always employ handwork. So it's less easy to do with, the, with just justifying it on the geometry alone. And the trick is to add some value. So my work has been looking into what is the value we can add to products to, to justify the, the cost of, of these processes. And these are some of the projects that I've done over, over the last decade that I'm going to use as case studies in what I'm talking to you about today. I'm going to focus on uh, recent work in additive metals because some of you might have come across my work before. So I'm going to focus very much on, on the metal side of things and projects that we've been doing recently, including one I've just finished with um, Frank and, and his team at the Jewelry Innovation Center we've been working on for the, for the last two years. So I started looking at trying to find some middle ground between mass manufacture and artisan production. Mass manufacturing has made high quality goods affordable for, for all of us. The downside of that is it's achieved it through standardization and, and uniformity. So we all have to have the same product. So we lose a bit of that personal approach. So I was figuring with additive, could you change the design with each one you build? Because there's no tooling in there, why can't you just modify the design each time? So that, that was the premise. And started off looking at lighting because I was a lighting designer. So the, the idea is we would have these designs that would, would change in real time. So this is Tuba from the first collection in 2003. And the idea is you'd go to a website and see the design changing in real time. At any given point, you can stop the animation, and that's the one you'll get. So the data at that point will be sent to a bureau. The bureau will produce it and send it into the post to you. And you'll receive in the next day or 48 hours, you'll receive this, this part in the post. You're not really trying to tune it. You're not really trying to cheek it. Uh, tweak it rather to your, your own desires. You're just merely saying, at this point, that's the one I want. And that was the premise, mass individualization. The, um, the issue with that was, if you buy a light, do you really care that your light is a one-off? Is that such a big story? And probably it's not. In jewelry, on the other hand, it becomes very important. If you've got a, first of all, customization is, is um, it's much easier to understand it in the, the jewelry sector. We all know about people who have had wedding rings made to order. It's a, very, it's a very common thing to do. And also, it has much more of a value because jewelry is typically a gift. And if that person has had that made specifically for you, all of a sudden, the piece has that much more of a value. So that seemed a better area to work in. So as the project progressed, we went from lighting into jewelry and into direct metal. So this is a design called Icon. This was one of the first jewelry pieces I made in direct metal in titanium. And this was produced as a culmination for my PhD thesis back in 2010. Well, the design began in 2006, but the, the culmination was 2010. And the idea was this was going to prove the concept of individualization with a batch of 100 pieces. We figured 100 pieces was near enough industrial scale. And what we had to prove was that we could have each one of these different. And the trick was for them, if you hold any of these two together, you should see an obvious difference. At the same time, you need to recognize a brand identity. You need, you need to be able to spot that that's, that's an icon design. Because if there's no brand identity there, there's no real value for a, for a company to get involved with this technology. So running through these, this is just a sample of some of the designs. You can see that they, although they're, they're very different one to another, that there's the same sort of character to them. You can spot that that's an icon, or hopefully, hopefully you can spot that that's an icon design. So we have the same common eye feature, this, this hole here, which moves from, from side to side, a up and down a little bit in the design. All the strands in the design tend to run top to bottom. That's a production issue, which is something I'm going to come on to with the, with the next design. So hopefully you get the idea of the, the individualization and trying to get that, 
that difference and at the same time maintain a brand identity. So at that point, I'd produced a range of designs in titanium and um, um, cooks and precious metals. We're just getting going with a partnership with EOS, marketing um, a, a, a direct metal printer for, for 18 karat gold. And they wanted to use some of my parts as demonstration pieces. So this is what we did. We took a design called, called Kure, which was originally designed for titanium and printed it very successfully, printed fine straight off in 18 karat gold. I mentioned with Icon previously a little bit about um, design for manufacture, which you have to take into account with, with metals, because with, with metals additive, we have a support structure. And with intricate jewelry designs, you've got to be very careful that you can get that support structure out. Post finishing can take, take a lot of time and sometimes be almost impossible to achieve. So we wanted to, to make sure that within this design, there's no support structure that we'd have to remove. So the only support structure is in this bridge at the bottom between these two tubes here which are for the neck cord. So here are three pieces on the machine. These, these were printed by 3D, uh, 3D RPD who are here in the hall. Um, first did they work with me in, in titanium. This is it snipped from the, uh, the machine. And this is the 18 karat gold version. And you can see that um, post finishing wise we've managed to smooth the outside of the design. We've still got some marking on the inside, which is um, the striations from the, the layer process. But in 18 karat gold, the luster of the material made those, those, that marking quite acceptable to me. You don't have the same degree of polish on the inside as you do on the out, but I think that's still that demarcation between the inside and shadowy, uh, the shadowy inside and the bright outside was, was quite acceptable. What wasn't quite so acceptable is when you translated my pieces direct from titanium to gold, we had a big problem. They were designed for a lightweight material and all of a sudden we were producing them in a very dense material, which made them very heavy to wear and made them far too expensive. So I think for, for Corey, we're talking about two and a half thousand pounds for the gold weight alone that went into, the, the, into this piece. So when we embarked on the, the TSB project with the Jewelry Innovations Center, um, we started looking again at our jewelry designs to do things that, that were specifically designed for, for direct metal in gold. So the first thing we did was revisit, essentially revisit um, Icon and create an evolution version of that design. And this is called Oho. It's very similar to Icon, but there are fewer strands there. We've also got provision for a, for a stone. In this case, it's a, a glass doll's eye, handmade glass doll's eye. And so we have a, an ovoid build envelope, and we're going to allow strands to grow, a certain number of strands to grow within that ovoid build envelope and uh, to fill that form with, with, with strands of gold. So this is iteration one, two, one and two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And these are the five we produced for, as demonstrators for the, for the TSB project. And again, you can see that obvious difference between, between them, but also the sa at the same time, hopefully at the same time, maintaining that, that family identity. Quick note on the, the build of that, we designed this to build upside down so we, we present the larger surface rather than the point, we present the larger concave surface to the, sorry, convex surface to the, the build, tip, build bed. Um, very little support required apart from these spigots. These spigots are to carry that stone and, and they have to come, they have to be normal to those strands and therefore they need some support structure. So the bulk of that support we're seeing there is, is for those spigots for the to accept the, uh, the stone setting. And this is the actual part straight from the, the build process. So that is Icon. The, the feedback we're getting from, from customers at this point was individual, individualization is great, but it doesn't, it's not hands-on enough. They wanted a little bit more input to the design to, to get some value from it. So we started to look at what, would I, what, what freedom would I give to the consumer? Would I be willing to give to the consumer? Because I'm a little bit precious as a designer. I don't like people messing with my design, so how can I give consumers a little bit more control and get them a bit in, more involved in the process without, as I would see it, my designs being disturbed. The solution we found was a range of jewelry called um, Super Kitsch. And this is a jewelry that is basically, it's a virtual assemblage of, of con contemporary iconography. So taking the idea of a charm bracelet where you've got these little icons and assembling them virtually into jewelry pieces. Because I didn't mind too much which pieces were chosen. My concern was the overall form after it's assembled. So I could allow the consumer to get involved and pick pieces from a, from a library. 
So we have a library of, of, of 3D iconography that people can choose to have their jewelry assembled from. And so this is a bangle that um, assembles itself in real time. So this is a, a slice through, through, um, through the, the bangle. It's one with an open bottom that slips over the wrist. So you've got like, we, we, we keep a gap on the bottom here so it'll slip over the wrist. And pieces are added on the, uh, on the, um, the, the left hand side there. They then rotate around clockwise until they hit this stop plane here. When the second piece is, piece is added, it rotates around until it's either the stop plane or a pre-existing part and so on. It builds back around anti-clockwise around the wrist. And I'll show you that happening now. It's a little bit of a dirty screen grab, but you'll get, a, you'll get the impression of this building in, in, in real time. And then we had three phases of consumer engagement. The first, in the first instance, they can look at this li library and as a social media thing, they can just simply like or dislike things. They can vote things in and out of that library. Second stage from that, going a little bit further, they can make suggestions. And if they suggest something, if they suggest a video view camper and lots of people like that suggestion, then we'll go away and we'll, we'll model that camper and add that to the library. The third phase, the most ambitious one, is where people can actually contribute their own models to that, that library. It's slightly problematic as some libraries can be, some of the models that come in can be slightly dirty, um, but increasingly people have access to free online CAD software. They can scan things with photogrammetry on them with their mobile phone and, and, and capture those as models. So there's increasingly there's a way for the layperson to, to, to actually create their own models. So we wanted to give that as a possibility for people to um, create jewelry in that way. Following on from that, contributing pieces, this is, this is a, again another piece from the Gold Project called Collect. And this was to try and find a new life for what we call retired jewelry. We've probably all got family heirlooms, bits of jewelry that have been handed down. And very often these things are quite precious to us and have a material value, but actually they're not fashionable enough to wear anymore. They're, they're, they, they're not contemporary enough for, for us to want to wear uh, on a daily basis or even for, uh, even for more, more formal evenings. So this was the, the idea was to, to create contemporary jewellery around these, these retired pieces. And what we had is some pieces from a uh, Victorian charm bracelet. These were, these were incredibly beautiful pieces. I found these little, it's a crown, a kettle and a, a little trophy. Very beautiful pieces, but they were, they were on a very chunky charm bracelet which, which had no, no particular appeal. And, and our challenge was to take, that, take those three pieces and put them into a contemporary piece. And we um, reverse engineered those and designed a little bangle around them. So here's, here's the reverse engineered pieces and a bangle they're going to drop within. And what we're doing is stopping the additive manufacturer build three times to drop those pieces in. It's something that's been seen quite a lot where people will create a basket and drop a gemstone in and, and carry the basket on. That, that's fair enough. But to do it three times and to trap things quite tightly was, was very much a challenge for the process. So we stop it at the bottom, we drop the kettle on, we stop it in the middle and drop that, the, the crown on, we stop it near the top here and, and drop the trophy on. And that's why we're building this thing in this orientation, which makes the least sense in terms of the, the, the height of the build, makes it a more expensive build, but allows you to drop these pieces on. And this is the piece as built. You can see the lots of support structure there. And there's the finished piece with the, with the, the, charms, the charms in place. I don't really have enough time to go into this in a lot of detail, it, but it was, it was, this is, is something to, a project to talk about on, on its own, because there are lots of challenges there. The first one was software, the preparation software. All of a sudden we had some pieces in that build that the software could see and the software wanted to support, but we didn't want to support these existing pieces, the, the crown and the, and the kettle and the, and the cup. We wanted those to be left alone. We had to have them within the, in the build so that the, the software didn't put supports in the places that they would be. We then had to have the supports robust enough that so when the build, build stopped halfway, they would be strong enough to be, for us to be able to slip those parts on without bending them. All these projects are about trying to build this value, to build stories around the design. And this is a, a, a ring called um, T-Rex versus the, the Gorilla. I've got to be very careful with the name because it's, it's inspired by Japanese 1950s sci-fi. And there's two monster names that might, might spring to mind when you see these that I can't mention for, for legal reasons. Apparently, there's a, a notice in an LA uh, attorney's office that says, if you think Godzilla's scary, you should meet his attorney. So I'm selling well, well credit of, of certain names. And I, were, I collaborated with a South African sculptor for film and video with this project. 
And we scripted this like a, like a movie set um, with a fight sequence between um, the, the monsters. We actually acted this out to choreograph this with suits. We've got a lovely gorilla suit. Unfortunately, the nearest we could get to T-Rex was Barney, which didn't work quite so well. But there you go. Uh, then we, we built up sketches from that, that fight sequence. And what we've ended up with, with is a series of rings, a series of five rings. This is iteration one, where the two monsters get together. Two, the gorilla gets a good right hook in. T-Rex comes back with a nice bite on the forearm but the gorilla breaks free and there's the knockout blow from the gorilla. But to get the, to get the full value from that, you have to see the, the animated, it's a, it's a manga animation, you have to see the, the manga animation as well as have the, have the ring. And so to achieve that, we actually have a QR code on the base of the ring. That if you scan with a mobile device, you will see that man, manga animation played over the top of the, of the ring. So the final design I want to show to you today um, it's called Heartbeat. Heartbeat is one way where I've allowed the consumer even more uh, access to the design. They can actually distress the design with a hammer. So the idea is that you go into a pop-up shop and you're given this nice little presentation box here with this palm size um, heart. And it's hollow, it's a hollow copper heart made out of thin sheet metal, a bit like an Easter egg. You get that on the hammer and you or you and your partner can go into a corner with a hammer and start beating this thing up and change the shape of it. You then hand it back to the assistant and we do a nice 360 degree scan, capture that data, shrink it down and turn it, down, turn it into a pendant. And I'm gonna let Marla, uh, my character, explain this design to you. So at this point, I'm gonna pass over to Marla. A heart that can be the crop out of, and then you turn into some kind of pretty gold necklace thing. Computer 3D printing or something? Well, I want one. Shall we dance? My friend is good in that dress, does she? And that can of pasta? Making up is the best. So thank you very much to, to Marla there. Uh, that was a bit, a bit of a whistle-stop tour through, through what's over a decade of work now, but I hope you got some impression of, of what we're doing. I think a lot of these projects can, can seem frivolous, perhaps they are, but I think the principles and this added value and what we can build in with additive technology is extremely important. So thank you very much for sticking around for the last presentation of the day. Uh, thank you very much.